your the specialist um, arbitrators uh, um, academics somehow at the same time who agreed with great pleasure to share their own, own insight on practice uh, to get their own perspectives on the issues concerning intra-EU BETs, on issues concerning uh, investment law reform and uh, and other 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 questions so let's start from the first uh, speaker from somehow Switzerland, Geneva, uh, a little bit from Bulgaria, uh, the person whom I know, the Dr. Dr. Dafina Atanasova, who is a lecturer um, at Geneva LLM on international dispute settlement, where she teaches international and commercial investment arbitration and carries out research as a part of Geneva Center for International Dispute Settlement, a joint research center of the Graduate Institute and the University of Geneva. Prior, prior to joining uh, Geneva, Dafina was a research fellow at the Center of International Law at uh, National University of Singapore, very international profile, let's see. She worked as a legal also co consultant and UNSTAD, a research assistant at the University of Geneva and as associate in a law firm situated in Sofia, Bulgaria. Dafina actually defended her PhD at University of Ge uh, Geneva, summa cum laude, and uh, is admitted to the bar of in, uh, in Bulgaria. Dafina will focus mostly now on more general topic concerning uh, past, present, and future of uh, international dispute settlement in Central and Eastern Europe and itself. So, dear Dafina, the floor is yours and let's, uh, let's start a very interesting discussion with you. Thank you so much, Silvega. Um, first of all, for the kind for the kind invitation, then for the um, quite generous introduction. I am by far the outsider in the group of this panel, meaning that I am someone who has very little to do with my own state's policy on investor state dispute settlement or investment treaty reform. I will do my best um, instead of representing and, and showing from experience the, the knowledge that comes with negotiating from the perspective of a state. Um, I will instead try to do a bird's eye view of Central and Eastern Europe and potentially try to identify common threads um, within Central and Eastern European countries when it comes to investor state dispute settlement, but also um, investment treaty reform interests to a certain extent. And to do so, I will go through three relatively brief um, topics. One is the place of investment treaties, sorry, the place of Central and Eastern Europe in investment treaties, so the um, negotiation practices, etc. Central and Eastern Europe in ISDS, meaning um, the experiences of countries with respect to cases. Um, and then um, and then the third part would be focused on um, Central and Eastern Europe and investment treaties and ISDS reform. So in order to do so, let me start with a short introduction of what I will mean by Central and Eastern Europe. Um, so there are 11 European Union member states that are typically considered to be part of Central and Eastern Europe. They're the common denominator um, is their geographical location, but also historical common threads. Um, importantly, Central and Eastern European countries go beyond the EU, but given that the focus of today's panel is much more on intra-EU BITs and their place um, and their place in investment law policy, I will stick with the 11 EU member states from Central and Eastern Europe and therefore not discuss the place of countries such as Albania, which are otherwise certainly part of Central and Eastern Europe. Um, one of the common commonalities of Central and Eastern European countries is that they joined the EU um, 
from 2004 to 2013. Um, another important commonality is that all countries are FDI importers. They are capital importing countries and that in a certain sense distinguishes them from the original member states to the, um, to the EU, so the, the EU at 15. Um, the example here of FDI flows that is shown comes from sources at UNCTAD. The picture would be the same whether we look at FDI flows or at FDI stocks. Um, all the countries from Central and Eastern Europe are much more capital importing countries than exporting. Um, the two exceptions to, or the two countries that come closer to a as much capital import as export are Czechia and, um, and Estonia. So that is something that, that links Central and Eastern European countries together first. Their accession to the EU um, as the third and fourth and fifth wave of accession links them together as well. Now, what does that mean? in terms of investment treaties for Central and Eastern European countries? And can we see common threads in how they have negotiated their investment treaties? Um, and we can, in a certain sense. There are three phases in investment treaty practice that we can see across most Central and Eastern European countries. The first is linked to, um, to the phase of history of Central and Eastern European countries um, as, part of the, as part of the Eastern Bloc. Um, these types of treaties that were signed earlier than the 90s or at the beginning of the 90s are, um, are have limited dispute settlement provisions and allow for a limited scope of investment tr treaty arbitration, typically allowing only for expropriation claims to go to arbitration or for certain countries such as Bulgaria, um, very often only for the amount of, of compensation due under an expropriation that would um, be allowed to to be subject to investor state dispute settlement. Now, there is a second phase um, that follows these treaties, which is the EU integration economic transition gold standard BITs that were signed a bit later and their signature was encouraged um, in all Europe agreement, meaning agreements, meaning pre-accession um, agreements with the European Union and its then member states. Um, the signature of the Energy Charter Treaty, which is a multilateral agreement specifically protecting investors in the field of energy, also pertains to um, also is signed and is part of this second phase of treaty making in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and then we have the third phase, which starts more or less in 2015, which is one of reform. Part of it is EU driven, part of it is country driven. Um, and it is linked to both BITs and broader economic agreements. I will come back to that at the end of my presentation. What is interesting to know already for the first two phases of um, the development of Central and Eastern European treaty practice is that at these phases, Central and Eastern European countries um, are all identified as rule takers in investment treaty making. That is the treaties, their treaty networks basically show that they have been working um, or in a certain sense that 
other countries' models have um, have had an impact, a significant impact on the final content of early investment treaties signed by Central and Eastern European countries. So these, this is a brief overview of the general content of um, investment, of the general stages of development um, of Eastern European countries' BIT networks. Um, moving to how this relates more specifically to intra-EU BITs, importantly, there around half of the BITs of all Central and Eastern European countries are ones that were signed with um, member states of the European Union um, prior to the accession of the respective member to the European Union and which then became intra-EU BITs at the time of accession. Um, again, Importantly, that leaves us with a total number of um, 500, more or less 500 Central and Eastern European BITs, of which 184 are intra-EU ones. And of those, the majority are signed between Central and Eastern European countries and the original members of the EU. Um, this is just to put in context the treaty networks of most Central and Eastern European countries. Um, and with these preliminary remarks in mind, it I just need to add that Central and Eastern European countries are also members to broader economic agreements with investment protection and ISDS. One in force, the Energy Charter Treaty, um, which has been interpreted by investment tribunals um, to apply both, in, both uh, between EU member states and between a member state and a um, and a non-member state, there is no, um, that interpretation is contested, uh, but it currently stands in a number of investment arbitrations. And as a result, it should be taken into account as something that represents litigation risk for, um, for all potential respondents. Um, in the context of the Energy Charter Treaty. Um, importantly, also the scope of application of the Energy Charter Treaty overlaps with over 50% of the Central and Eastern European BITs, some of them intra-EU BITs, but a number of them extra um, EU BITs, and I will come back to the importance of that in a second. Um, also, Central and Eastern European countries are, of course, uh, parties to the new generation of um, investment protection treaties that are signed by the EU, which are not yet in force, um, but will probably be so soon. Now, with this network of treaties in mind, which um, which show to what extent, well, which make a difference as to the profile of countries with respect to um, investment disputes, move to the investment disputes themselves. And what we see again is a common thread um, with respect to investment disputes concerning Central and Eastern European countries, meaning that Central and Eastern European countries are only rarely home states to claimants in investment arbitration. They are generally speaking the respondent um, in an investment treaty arbitration. Um, there are, as we can see on the screen, 164 ISDS cases against Central and Eastern European countries. 
um, as opposed to only 30 cases in which investors from these countries from the region have claimed, often against other states in the region, by the way. Um, importantly, the majority of the cases are based on intra-UBITs. And here we, um, so the majority of these cases are based on intra-UBITs. And of those cases in which Central and Eastern European countries have been respondents, 92 cases have been decided. Generally speaking, Central and Eastern European countries fare well with respect to the outcomes of ISDS cases from a macro perspective, meaning that um, in about 10 cases, jurisdiction was declined um, and 26 of the 92 have resulted in a decision in favor of the investor compared to the rest which had, have resulted either in um, dismissal of all claims on the merit or jurisdiction declined or the lack of award of damages on the part of the tribunal. However, it is worth still knowing that there are a number in, in, the, in the parlor of investment treaty um, negotiation, negotiators and also in the context of investment treaty arbitration, there are several areas of famous Central and Eastern European cases that have led even to um, investment, to durable um, investment treaty reform. One example um, is the application or the attempt to apply most favored nation clauses to jurisdictional, um, to jurisdictional requirements, which has uh, been the case in Plama or was attempted in Plama versus Bulgaria, Austrian airlines, et cetera, et cetera. And this has led to a number of states um, clarifying that most favored nation provisions should not be um, applied to um, investor state dispute settlement. Similarly, the poster example of CME and Lauder versus Czech Republic um, is something that has led to uh, more effective provisions on consolidation between investment, um, investment claims and also in some of the Central and Eastern European models um, to consolidation also between treaties. So consolidation of proceedings that are based on different treaties. Um, and as, sorry, as in a number of other, um, as with respect to a number of other countries, there have been feeding tariff cases against Central and Eastern European countries, of course. Now, where does that lead us with respect to reform? Um, Central and Eastern European countries have been part of the reform discussion in two ways. One is as part of the EU. And in that respect, there has been a partial exit of the system with respect to intra-EU BITs. And that is something that my co-panelists will discuss in much more detail in a second. Um, the reform at the EU level as the previous panel um, explained in quite some detail, involves proposals as to a multilateral reform of the system at UNCITRAL. It proposes a revision of the Energy Charter Treaty. Um, it also includes certain screw tightening mechanisms and new provisions in EU um, investment treaties, whether they go far enough or not, is something that depends on, um, on people's view. Importantly, there are certain areas in which Central and Eastern European countries need to or are doing um, individual reform efforts as well. And part of this is, in particular, the reform of external policy relating to investment, meaning 
um, determining how and to what extent extra EU VATs will um, continue to be signed. Um, and on, in that respect, we can see different levels of engagement by, um, by different countries, meaning that, for instance, Bulgaria is only now starting to do a monitoring, whereas there are countries that have um, already several models, um, several versions of model BITs out there. Um, importantly, there is something that Central and Eastern European countries, or to my knowledge, is not done yet, which is to review and reassess old, the old stock of external BITs and to attempt renegotiation. And finally, there is again something on which countries diverge with respect to their initiatives, and that is preparing their domestic institutions for um, taking into account their investment treaty obligations and responding to investor state claims with, again, certain countries um, such as the Czech Republic or Slovakia that have been very proactive and others um, such as, to my knowledge, Poland, Poland and Bulgaria that have been less so. Um, and with that, I thank everyone for the time. Um, Thank you, Dafina, very much. And I leave the floor to my co-panelists, who I hope will disagree strongly with a number of the factual statements that I made. Yeah, yeah. I think it is. It, it may be a hot discussion, actually, having you know, having in mind all our panelists here, different positions and different experience from different perspectives. Let's say. So we are going to have our next uh, prominent speaker, I could say, uh, who has uh, lots of years experience with all the issues we are discussing now uh, about intra-UBATs intra issues and concerning the country, Slovakia, uh, the country which is somehow provoked, uh, I could say, this investment law reform in all the U Europe. And we here have a very prominent speaker, Miriama Kiselova, who is actually an investment expert and legal advisor at the permanent representation of the Slovak Republic to the EU since 2018. She actually deals with the investment protection agreements, multilateral investment court, amendment of exit rules, the energy charter treaty issues and modernization, intra UBATs termination, and lots of other issues concerning um, investment law reform. Before diplomacy, she was uh, a senior state counselor at the Minister of Finance of the Slovak Republic, ne negotiating BATs and participating in, in international investment arbitration and before European courts and representing the Slovak Republic interest before OECD on central on start in investment matters. She actually currently is a PhD candidate at the Charles University in the field of public international law. Miriama, it would be very interesting to hear uh, you. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Selvega, for the kind introduction and many thanks, Inga, again for the very kind invitation. It's my pleasure to be with you, although only virtually, but it's great. So I will start sharing my screen. Okay. Good. So before I start, uh, I will just make a short disclaimer, which uh, basically all the uh, state representatives usually say I'm speaking in my private capacity and uh, nothing what I will say should be attributed to the government of the Slovak Republic. Thank you very much. Now, next slide. Uh, this is the content of my contribution today. Uh, first, uh, I will just make a short uh, enlisting of the signed intra-EU BITs on behalf of the Slovak Republic. Then I will only very shortly um, describe the arbitrations against the Slovak Republic under the intra-EU BITs and one under the ECP. Uh, thirdly, I will shortly describe the Ahmed judgment by the Court of Justice 
And uh, fourthly, I will uh, explain the process of the termination of the intra-EU BITs, um, which I can divide into the signature of the declarations, uh, the signature of the plurilateral treaty, and the bilateral termination. Okay, so we had uh, these 22 treaties, which were signed prior to entry into EU. And uh, these treaties were basically, uh, as I explained, terminated subsequently uh, after the, the Ahmed judgment. And uh, before that, of course, they, they triggered arbitrations, quite uh, many of them. Uh, in total, we had uh, nine cases under the intra-UBITs and the ECT. Uh, five of them were based on the Dutch BIT, uh, two of them under the Austrian BIT, one under the Polish, and uh, one under the Energy Charter Treaty. Regarding the subject matter, four cases were related to the public health insurance. These were the Ahme one case, uh, uh, then the URAM case, and uh, the so-called HICE, Health Insurance Central Eastern Europe. Uh, this was the first, uh, let's say, first round of the reform of the public health insurance. And the fourth case was in, uh, triggered in, uh, after the second attempt to, to reform the public health insurance. We had two cases in the energy sector. One of them was the, the case of the Slovak gas against the Slovak Republic. This was related to the gas regulation. The second case was the case of U.S. Steel. Uh, this related to the electricity regulation and uh, the tariff setting. We had one case uh, related to mineral water extraction. Uh, this was the case of the Polish investor Mushnienka. We had uh, earlier one case related to aviation, which was already mentioned on the screen, the Austrian airline case. And uh, one case in uh, relation to the textile industry, the Ostergetel and Laurentius versus the Slovak Republic. Uh, so this is um, the shortest uh, description. Later, I will go more into detail. Uh, currently, we don't have any pending cases. And regarding uh, these above mentioned cases, these were either one in merits, uh, one of them one in jurisdiction. Then, um, of course, Ahmed, as such, uh, the Arbitration uh, was lost, but the uh, award was uh, subsequently terminated by the German uh, Supreme Court, the Bundesgerichtshof, uh, as a consequence of the Ahmed uh, judgment of the Court of Justice. The case was settled without financial compensation, or uh, uh, there was uh, the case was, uh, was uh, the claim was withdrawn by the claimant, or there were no damages awarded. So. Uh, I think this was a pretty good result. Now let's go into more detail. Okay, uh, Ostergetel and Laurentius cases. Uh, this case was related to the privatization of a textile company, the so-called Bratislava Thread Company. This company, however, became over the years indebted. And this happened despite the fact that um, there were several uh, tax, um, um, I would, tax incentives provided by, by the Slovak Republic. So uh, subsequently, <clears throat> and, uh, the claimant started arbitration. Um, in 2006, uh, the case was won in, in merits in, in 2012. So we did not have to play, pay the compensation, which was 298 million. Thank you. So the next slide. <laughs> Um, our uh, Austrian Airlines, this was the case related to the aviation industry. It was related to the trilateral uh, treaty between Austrian Airlines, um, Air Slovakia, and the Slovak Ministry of Transport. However, the implementation of this treaty uh, could uh, uh, trigger uh, issues in relation to the state aid Notara state aid. So subsequently, the uh, foreign investor Austrian Airlines uh, commenced arbitration. Uh, this case was started in 2008 and the one in the jurisdiction phase in 2009. 
Yes, now we are coming to the Ahmea case, which I understand that for most of the European Union is interesting only because of the Ahmea judgment. Actually, for Slovak Republic, it's, I would say, uh, equally or very much important from the subject matter of, of the dispute. The dispute was related to the um, attempt to modify the, the public health insurance. Uh, here, I will allow myself to go a little bit more into detail because it's important. Uh, the Slovak Republic has a compulsory and universal system of public health insurance. Uh, which uh, was originally provided only by a single state in, uh, insurer. Uh, however, uh, from 1994, uh, private insurers were allowed to enter the market. And uh, from 2004, there were legislative changes which allowed these uh, private insurers to start uh, to try to compete for, for client, the clients, the insurers, to generate profit and uh, to, to have uh, expenses in relation to the administration of the health insurance company. The system was not very popular and in 2007, the reform was introduced, um, which uh, among others uh, did not allow any more the use of uh, agents to um, gain more insurance. Uh, there was introduced a cap on the expenses and the private, uh, the public, uh, these health insurance companies were not allowed to uh, generate profit anymore. So this so-called ban of profit uh, triggered three arbitrations. And um, basically all the three of them were um, either won in, in the, uh, during the arbitration case or subsequently Ahmea case as such was later uh, terminated by the German uh, Supreme Court in, in 2018. So basically this, this, uh, this is in relation to the Ahmea case as such in relation to the subject matter. I already described the same uh, subject matter of the dispute also for the HICE company. The difference is that in this case, the dispute took also place in the local court, the, the Slovak court. Uh, in this case, we won the arbitration proceeding in 2011. The court proceeding, the first instance we won in 2019 and the review is uh, still pending. Uh, your own case. This was, uh, as I explained, the same subject matter. Uh, again, this case uh, was run in parallel before the, the Slovak court. Uh, we won the arbitration in 2014 in the so-called second jurisdictional award, uh, where we claimed that uh, it's likely due to the case that the claimant uh, commenced also the judicial proceedings before the local court. The arbitration clause was framed that unless otherwise agreed, the state, uh, the, the parties should. Uh, referred their dispute to the arbitration tribunal. And uh, since the claimant commenced the judicial proceedings and did not uh, interrupt them because of the arbitration case, uh, the tribunal concluded that we agreed on uh, resolving the, the issue before the, the local court. After the, this victory, the claimant withdrew the claim from the, the Slovak court. Ahmea II arbitration is um, probably less known, but very interesting. Again, um, in this case, in uh, 2012, the Slovak Republic announced the intention, and I underline intention, to create a single health insurance company. And in this project, the, uh, the private health insurance companies would be offered a compensation to, to leave the market in order to enable the creation of this uh, uh, single universal uh, health insurance company. Uh, the, um, the investor Ahmed was uh, not very enthusiastic about this and commenced arbitration as a, as a reaction uh, where basically 
the the claim can be simplified as preventing the Slovak Republic to pursue the legislative process, which uh, which was not accepted by the tribunal and very rightly not accepted. Uh, here I will allow myself to make a short quotation uh, from the from the award. Uh, where the tribunal explained that uh, the tribunal is not empowered to intervene in a democratic process of a sovereign state and cannot do so absent uh, very specific language to that effect. This, the design and implementation of its uh, public health care policy is for the state alone to assess and the state must balance the different and sometimes competing interests, such as its duty to ensure appropriate health care to its population and its duty to honor its international investment protection commitments. The tribunal is being invited to engage into a speculative exercise looking into the future to examine a state conduct that has not materialized yet and whose features may not be determined with certainty at this stage. Uh, the tribunal concludes that uh, that is impermissible under the BIT and thus falls outside the ambit of tribunal's jurisdiction. So we won the case in the 2014 in the jurisdictional phase. Another arbitration was uh, the Slovak uh, gas uh, in this, uh, against the Slovak Republic. In uh, this case, the subject matter was related to the price regulation in the gas industry, in particular, the submission of the price proposals, the decision making uh, through the general meeting of the uh, gas in, uh, Slovak gas company and the procedures of the Office of the Regulation of the Network of, uh, Industries, and the state procedure for voting on appeals and also the, uh, the dividend taxation. Uh, this uh, particular arbitration uh, was concluded in uh, 2012 uh, by uh, non-financial settlement where the shares were transferred to Energetický and Promyslovy holding company. The US Steel case, um, in this case, uh, as I explained at the beginning, the subject matter was relation, related to the tariffs of the for the electricity in particular for its generation and for use of its uh, own resources uh, this claim was uh, also uh, discontinued by the withdrawal at the end uh, the withdrawal of the of the claimant this was uh, uh, basically done after the slovak republic and we still signed a memorandum of understanding with, in which the, the investor decided to uh, basically undertook to stay in Slovakia as, as the main employer and um, also to, to withdraw the, the claim. Um, the last uh, arbitration is the Mushnyanka case, which was uh, uh, we, uh, um, concluded only quite recently in October 2020. This case was related to the exploitation and bottling of the mineral water. The case basically related the intention of the claimant to transport the mineral water by a pipeline from Slovakia to, the, to Poland and bottle it in the Polish factory and then sell it. This was something that was not allowed by the Slovak constitution, which uh, introduced an amendment to the constitution, uh, which prevented the export of the mineral water via pipelines. In this case, uh, I described it a little bit more into detail because although there was admitted a breach of fair and equitable treatment, there was no compensation awarded. And this was uh, explained by the fact that the um, intention would not be able to perform uh, anyway, and basically no damages uh, were cured to the uh, to the investor in in this relation. And the tribunal also confirmed the that the amendment of the Slovak constitution did not um, did not introduce any any breach of its uh, international commitments uh, related to the international investment uh, agreement. So this was the last arbitration case. Regarding the Akhmer judgment, I will try to okay, speak up the pace 
in case I'm already taking too much time. Uh, here, I would like to underline also one thing that uh, maybe we started this proceeding, uh, but we were not alone. So there were several states that uh, um, took our part in, in this proceeding. That's why I stated them on, on, the, on the slide. And it, uh, the inapplicability of the intra-EU BITs uh, has not been used as a jurisdictional objection only by the Slovak Republic. It has been used by other states as well. Only we had uh, enough uh, courage and stamina to put it up to the, uh, the Court of Justice. Um, the preliminary question uh, process uh, did not happen fast and overnight. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it took the German courts four years to refer it to the Court of Justice and then another two years for uh, to come the, with the decision for the Court of Justice, uh, which um, issued the quite notorious judgment from the 6th March uh, 2018, stating the inapplicability of the arbitration clause um, in the Slovakia Netherlands uh, BIT, uh, arguing with the um, uh, the, the duty to uh, prevent the autonomy and privacy of, of EU law. There was a, quite a detailed uh, explanation why the investment arbitration tribunals do differ from uh, or cannot be considered as uh, judicial uh, bodies. They have to be distinguished from uh, uh, um, the courts like the Benelux court and they are of course different also from the commercial arbitration tribunals. And um, as a conclusion, the court has stated that uh, as such, it's not prohibited to create a judicial body by international treaty, but in this particular case, it would uh, be, um, the, uh, um, it would happen the um, interpretation and application of the EU law, which uh, of course would endanger the EU judicial system. So, uh, this much regarding the, the Ahmea, Ahmea judgment. Um, this uh, judgment as such did not uh, co cause the immediate termination. We had to go through a certain process, which again did not happen immediately. It took a certain time, basically uh, two years till the signature. Um, I'm just shortly referring to first step, which was the declaration signed in uh, January 2019 by, by the member states. Uh, for the sake of uh, clarity and accuracy, I will explain that there were three declarations signed. This is the one signed by the majority of the member states, which also contains reference to the ECT. Uh, some other member states signed their own declaration and one uh, standalone declaration signed by Hungary, just to, to be accurate. The, uh, the states basically acknowledged uh, the legal consequences of the Ahmed judgment. They pledged to terminate the intra-EU BITs at the same time to uh, ensure and, uh, the effective legal protection. And uh, there were references to the concluded cases and the fact that no new cases should be commenced and potential steps to the ECT. Now coming to my uh, final slide, the plurilateral termination treaty, uh, it took, if I remember correctly, 10 negotiating rounds. Eventually it was signed on uh, 5th May, 2020. Uh, it terminates all the intra-EU BITs, including the sunset clauses, uh, declares an applicability of the arbitration clauses, it sets regime for the concluded pending and future cases with the issuance of the Ahmed judgment as a reference date. It uh, stipulates the duty to intervene in the pending arbitrations and in the duty in relation to the enforcement before the national courts. Uh, as a kind of uh, remedy, it offers the structured dialogue, which is certain mediation procedure to the investors and it uh, offers a pardon of the statutory limitation of time as access to national courts. And uh, last remark is to the fact that uh, not all the states signed this plurilateral termination treaty. 
uh, with the states uh, listed below, we already signed, uh, we already finalized the, the bilateral process of termination. Uh, regarding uh, this bilateral termination treaty, I checked this week, I think 12 states already finished the, the ratification procedure. So that would be it from my side, uh, and I'm happy to reply to any questions. Thank you very much, Miriyama. Uh, uh, so we are a bit short in time, but uh, a longer, longer presentation, but actually very interesting one. <laughs> so Bivyaslo Slovakia is one of the most experienced litigator and the strongest opponent for investors, <laughs> let's say. Um, so it was very interesting to hear, hear you from inside and all these presentations. So next, our um, speaker, speaker from uh, neighborhood is uh, Dr. Yaroslav Kudrna from Czech Republic. Uh, I'm very happy to meet you here uh, with no technical, technical any issues anymore. Um, uh, Kudrna is uh, the head of the International Arbitration and Investment Protection Unit at the Ministry of Finance of Czech Republic. So he's re also very well insight of or and at the heart of all the problems concerning intra BATs issues. He defends the Republic um, in investment arbitrations, negotiations BATs on its behalf and represents it in the international forums, including UNCITRAL and uh, Energy Charter Treaty Modern Modernization Group. Prior to joining uh, the ministry, Kudurna worked several years in International Arbitration Group of White and Case in New York. Actually, he also passed the New York bar exam and Paris bar exam. So I'm very well, very impressed by your like, education and, and, and professional experience and inviting you to, to speak uh, on uh, experience with arbitrations from the Czech Republic perspective. The floor is yours. Yes. Thank you. Good, good morning from Prague to everyone. And uh, many thanks, Solveja, for this uh, kind uh, introduction. And many thanks for inviting me. It is a pleasure to, to participate in this panel, uh, especially to, to see uh, many of my dear colleagues, uh, to see them uh, at least virtually. Um, and uh, we'll probably start meeting in Brussels again, hopefully, hopefully soon. I need to note that the views expressed here are only mine and should not be attributed to the Ministry of Finance of the Czech Republic. I will tackle arbitration reform in the EU from the Czech perspective. I will first explain that the intra-UBITs controversy is not a new issue for the Czech Republic. And I will then discuss uh, the conflicting reactions to the ACMEA decision by arbitral tribunals and, and member states. And finally, I will present the uncertain future of investment protection in the EU. To begin my contribution, I would like to highlight that the calls for the termination of intra-UBITs started long before the ACMEA decision. For example, the government of the Czech Republic issued a resolution in May of 2005, about a year after we joined the EU, calling for the termination of the intra-UBITs. And interestingly, the explanatory report from the time mentioned that the BITs played a role in the 90s during the transformation of our economy and development of legal environment to attract foreign investment. According to the report, this development was mainly achieved with the entry to the EU, and thus there was no need for the intra-UBITs anymore. In 2006, the EU authorities advised the Czech Republic on a couple of occasions that it should terminate the intra-UBITs. There was, however, no express mention of incompatibility of arbitration clauses with EU law. The conflict between investment arbitration and EU law materialized soon afterwards in an award from, 2000, uh, from March 2007 in the Eastern Sugar case. The Czech Republic raised the intra-EU objection based on its accession to the EU. The tribunal noted that despite the letter, the European Commission has never started any infringement proceedings against states that had failed to terminate the intra-UBITs, which in the opinion of the tribunal showed the lack of any incompatibility. Concerning the argument based on Article 59 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of the Treaties, 
that a later treaty replaces an earlier treaty when they cover the same subject matter and are incompatible. The tribunal disagreed that the EU treaties and the BIT had the same subject matter. The tribunal noted that on one hand, the EU treaties were providing for fundamental freedoms and were mainly concerned with the investors' right to invest in the Czech Republic. On the other hand, the BIT focused on protecting the investment during its life. The crucial protection was access to investment arbitration, which the tribunal described as, uh, I quote, the best guarantee that the investment will be protected against potential undue infringements by the host state. The Czech Republic also asked the tribunal to refer the intra-EU BIT issue to the European Court of Justice. The tribunal decided that there was no need to refer a question to the ECJ in a case where the answer is not difficult. The tribunal also observed that the possibility of a referral to the European Court of Justice is a route not open to an arbitral tribunal, even if it has its seat in the European Union. The intra-EU objection was thus rejected. It was similarly rejected only a few months later in June 2007 by another tribunal in the Binder case. This case was interesting because the seat was in Prague and the Czech Republic started a set aside proceedings against the award on jurisdiction with hope that the intra EU issue would be ultimately referred to the ECJ. However, the award was upheld by the appellate court and the Czech Republic later withdrew the extraordinary appeal to the Supreme Court, because in the meantime, it won the arbitration on the merits in 2011. We had to then wait until 2016 when the German court sent such a preliminary question to the ECJ in the ACMA case. Despite the failure of the intra-EU objection at the time, the Czech Republic was still able to terminate by a mutual agreement the BITs with nine member states, including uh, Slovakia, Italy, Denmark, Estonia, Slovenia, Malta, Ireland, Poland, and Latvia. The other member states refused and did or did not react to the Czech Republic's proposal to terminate the intra UBITs. This is not surprising because, for example, in a report issued by the Economic and Financial Committee of the EU in December 2008, we can find that, uh, I quote, most member states did not share the Commission's concern in respect of arbitration risks and discriminatory treatment of investors, and a clear majority of member states preferred to maintain the existing agreements. The European Commission stepped up its pressure in 2015 with the start of the infringement procedures against the Netherlands, Austria, Romania, Slovakia, and Sweden for the incompatibility of its intra ubits with EU law and the European Commission requested their termination. At the time, the European Commission also started an EU pilot procedure with the Czech Republic regarding the same issue. However, the real change in regard to the intra-EU BITs only came in March 2018 with the ACMA decision. I would like to now discuss in turn a reaction to ACMA by the arbitral tribunals and member states. I would like to first uh, discuss investment tribunal's reaction in the cases against the Czech Republic pending at the time of the ACMA decision. I would like to particularly mention a recent award from 29 of April 2021 in the case Feinadel Holdings versus Czech Republic. The interesting fact was that this arbitration was brought under the same BIT which was at stake in the ACMA case. It was the BIT concluded between the Netherlands and Czechoslovakia, which continued to apply to both Slovakia and the Czech Republic. And in addition, the case was seated in the EU. Nevertheless, the decision on the Czech Republic's ACME objection did not bring any surprises. The tribunal stated that it was not bound by the ACME judgment. And then the tribunal further noted that although the ACME judgment precluded the application of Article 8 of the BIT, which is the arbitration clause, the CGEU did not rule in ACMEA on the procedural consequences of that inapplicability. The tribunal ruled that the Czech Republic's argument on the interpretation of Article 351 TFEU in favor of the automatic inapplicability of the arbitration clause 
was thus not directly supported by ACMEA. According to the tribunal, paragraphs one and two of the article 351 only impose an obligation of conduct and cannot be interpreted as a requirement of automatic inapplicability. The tribunal also considered the conditions for the application of Article 30 of the Vienna Convention. As the Czech Republic argued that Article 8 of the VIT became inapplicable in 2004 by the Czech Republic's accession to the EU. The tribunal decided that EU law does not contain a provision that would generally prohibit arbitration between investors and member states. On this basis, the tribunal found that Article 8 of the VIT was not contrary to the EU law. The best result with ACMEA objection, which the Czech Republic achieved, was that one arbitrator issued a dissenting opinion to an award rejecting the objection in another case last year. I will now move to the reaction of member states to ACMEA. The ACMEA decision seemed to change the position of member states, which resisted the termination of intra UBITs for a long time. In January 2019, the member states agreed in three separate declarations to terminate the intra-UBITs. And in May 2020, the Multilateral Termination Treaty was finally signed. The ratification is still pending in the Czech Republic, but I hope it will be concluded before the next parliamentary elections uh, this October. The Czech Republic is continuing separate negotiations with Austria, Finland, and Sweden to terminate those BITs, and I believe it should be done soon as well. Miriam Ma well described the declaration and the termination treaty, so I will not develop on those. I will just briefly comment on whether some alternative path were possible. First, it took more than a year to issue the declaration and two years to agree on the termination treaty. When we bilaterally terminate a BIT, including the sunset clause, the diplomatic note usually fits within one page. If the interested member states had simply terminated their mutual BITs, such an agreement could have been ready in months rather than two years. And nothing more was needed. The states could have still raised the ACMEA objection in pending cases as they kept doing anyway. The termination treaty instead tried to deal with pending cases, which added a lot of complexity without any tangible results so far. And I'm a bit skeptical that investors will actually use the alternatives the termination treaty provides for. But I will stop here with the hypotheticals. The decision to terminate the intra-EU BITs was made. So I will tackle the future of investment protection in the EU from both the intra-EU and extra-EU perspective. What might the future of intra-EU investment look like? The current situation is that the BITs are being terminated without any substitute framework in place, which is not optimal. One exception is investment in the energy sector, which is still covered by the ECP. The European Commission and the majority of member states, including the Czech Republic, express their view that the ECT is not applicable in tri-EU. However, six member states made clear in their declarations that they did not want to prejudge the application of ACMEA to the ECT. To achieve bigger consensus, the issue was in the end left out in the termination treaty. At the same time, we have already seen at least 33 tribunals decide that ACMEA does not apply to the ECT arbitrations. This decision was also reached in the concluded solar cases against the Czech Republic. So when can we expect more clarity on this issue? The question of compatibility of Article 26 of the ECT with EU law is now before the CGEU in the Athena case and in the proceeding regarding the opinion 120. It will be of great interest to see how the court's future judgment may reflect on the intra-EU arbitration under the ECT. And logically, the future decision should be reflected in the current negotiation on the modernization of the ECT. It will be also interesting to see what the approach of the US courts will be towards enforcing the awards against Spain, which are based on the intra-EU application of the ECT. In relation to the new intra-EU framework on protection of investment, 
the European Commission is supposed to come out soon with a legislative proposal. I do not know how it will look like. One could expect that it will include some substantive rules, but there is a question if uh, it will be on the level comparable with current investment law standards. The second issue is a procedural part and enforcement. The key part of the ISDS system is to provide a neutral forum for resolving disputes between investors and host states. European law can be as good as it can be, but without an independent adjudicator, it will not offer an effective protection to investors. Therefore, I personally hope that protection of investors would be set up similar to the Unified Patent Court, which consists of a court of first instance, a court of appeal, and a registry. And the court of first instance is supposed to have a central division as well as local and regional divisions. In the case of the UPC, each contracting state can set up a local division, but any panel of the UPC will have a multinational composition and judges will be appointed by the administrative committee composed of representatives of all contracting states by common accord. An obvious issue is the time. The UPC agreement was, for example, signed in 2013, and the court is still not up and running. Therefore, it might take a long time to establish a similar investment protection mechanism in the EU. Finally, given the lack of comprehensive investment protection in the EU at the moment, one feature of investment protection in Europe is the extra EU BITs to which ACMA does not apply. This was confirmed in the exit award issued in the CMC versus Mozambique case in 2019, where the tribunal rejected Mozambique's objection that ACMEA invalidated the arbitration clause in its BIT with Italy. For example, the Czech Republic has BITs with 60 countries outside the EU. And the EU itself and its member states negotiated new agreements with investment protection with Canada, Singapore, or Vietnam. These new agreements might be in the future subject to the multilateral investment court currently debated at UNCITRAL. This would make a lot of sense for the EU because the separate courts under each agreement do not make much sense in the long term. In Europe, we might also see an increase of arbitrations by investors based in Switzerland. Speaking of that, a Gazprom subsidiary in Switzerland filed an ECT claim against the EU in 2019. And we might see more restructuring of investments in the near future. It seemed that the UK after Brexit might be another center for such restructuring, but the UK has now changed its course and it seems that the BITs with EU member states will be also terminated. Given that there is no investment protection agreement between the EU and the UK on the horizon, there will be no protection in place anytime soon. In conclusion, I would like to ask a simple question. Is intra-EU investment arbitration dead? Richard Power answered it this way. Perhaps the time for obituaries is not yet near, but the headstone is already being carved. Until some intra-EU BITs remain in force, there will be intra-EU investment arbitration. But it is already clear that the end of intra-EU BITs is quickly approaching. And there is no alternative framework in place. So I believe that a comprehensive investment protection in the EU is urgently, is urgently required, particularly at a time after the COVID crisis where new investments will be desperately needed. Big corporations can restructure. They have also more influence are bet and are better positioned to resolve their disputes with governments. But it will be small and medium enterprises which will suffer from the current vacuum. For these companies, it might be too expensive to create a holding company in a third state, and they are thus dependent on national courts, which level of independence is far from uniform among the 27 EU member states. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Yaroslav, for a very nice and impressive presentation, and actually very good uh, uh, questions, issues uh, raised. 
And uh, uh, when I listen to you, it seems to me what, uh, as, uh, as a rule, usually it's very easy to start the war, to destroy some, something, but it's, it's, it's clear what's very difficult to build something new and valuable. And as usual in the war, it's very difficult to find out who is the winner and who is the loser and usually loses everyone. And, um, it, and, and, and it's, it, it seems that the way out may be an obvious event, but it will be very difficult in this situation. So our next speaker with the um, Dr. Wojciech Sadowski from Poland with his very ambitious, I could say, uh, presentation. Um, should we burn behind us unfinished bridges? Uh, a cautious story from Poland, actually, and a question concerning the future of investment disputes uh, before national courts. Wojciech Sadowski is the founding partner of uh, Queritius, a law firm. He focuses on international and transborder dispute resolution, working as a counsel and as arbitrator. Wojciech has been extensively involved in advisory work and client representation in matters involved, involving international investment treaties and acted for both investors and states. He also has broad experience in commercial arbitrations and litigations before domestic courts, the European Court of Human Rights, the General Court of the EU and the Court of Justice of the European Union. Before founding Queritius, Wojciech was a Warsaw and London partner at a leading global law firm and had almost 20 years of working in top legal brands. Waiting for you, Wojciech, and for your uh, opinion on what's next and what national court will do in such situation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Solveiga. Um, and thank you for inviting me uh, to this panel. Um, before I um, kick off with my presentation, I just need to make three uh, preliminary comments. Um, first is that um, I will be um, speaking in my personal capacity and nothing that I'm going to say can be attributed to any of my clients or, or, or the clients of my law firm. Uh, the second comment is that unfortunately I will need to um, drop off at 12.30 uh, sharp uh, due to other commitments. And thirdly, uh, we speak a lot um, these days about e equal representation in arbitration, and I cannot fail to note that uh, Yaroslav and I are the two men on the female-dominated panel. And this is a particular feature of Central Eastern Europe, I think, which distinguishes us in a better sense from our Western colleagues. So this is something when we speak about the contribution that we may bring to the world of international arbitration is something that I, want to, that I wanted to note. Um, so without more ado, I will pick up on, on where Yaroslav left it, uh, the uncertainty concerning um, the current state of affairs. As we all know, the post Achmea philosophy in Europe is that intra-EU investment disputes should be referred to national courts. It seems to me that in the name of political correctness, the governments and the EU institutions have decided to declare that national courts across the entire European Union are the efficient guarantors of the rule of law. And the reference to the unfinished bridges in the title of my presentation is a metaphor to the um, rule of law in Central Eastern Europe, and in particular to the notion of uh, independence and respect uh, to the judiciary. As we know, after the fall of, of the communism, this part of the world was struggling from the post-communist politicization of the judiciary, its corruption, inefficiency, and lack of resources. And I would agree that this was the very reason why international commercial arbitration flourished uh, in this part of the world um, for West East disputes, even after 1990. And the same was true for, invest, uh, for investment treaty arbitrations. It was required precisely because of the underdevelopment of the local judicial systems uh, in Central Eastern Europe. But now it seems that Europe has chosen to believe that Central European countries have successfully built this metaphorical bridge and moved their judicial uh, systems from biased, corrupt, and inefficient to the better bank of the river where courts are impartial, independent, respected, and efficient. But 
the question is whether the bridge is really completed or is Europe taking a leap of faith for fear of more investment treaty disputes hitting Germany, Spain, Slovakia, or Poland? And does the ECJ truly believes that it has mature and independent judicial partners all across Europe? Or is it just taking an advantage and, opportuni and opportunistically access alternative dispute resolution mechanisms in Europe in pursuit of its own monopolistic ambitions. And even if this metaphorical bridge has been built, uh, can we say it's firm and stable? Um, can the changes be undone and how easily? And this is what I would want to talk about using Poland as an example. For the purpose of this presentation, I assume that many of you are familiar uh, with at least certain facts and judgments concerning the digression of the independence of the Polish judicial system after 2016. But let me show you an insider perspective of which side of this bridge Poland currently is on and where it's going. And the direction is clearly backwards. Um, it's clear to us in Poland that the incumbent political forces uh, wish to be at a place where a group of judges will be politically dependent and dispositive, whereas the rest will be intimidated and coerced to accept the status quo. Now, let me show to you how it works uh, by starting with three personal stories. The man on the right um, in this picture is Judge Paweł Juszczyszyn. He issued an order requesting the Chancellor of the Parliament to produce certain politically sensitive documents, which he was entitled to do. The Chancellor didn't comply. Instead, the judge himself was removed from his post by the president of his court, a political appointee, which is the man on the left. Judge Justician appealed to the competent labor court, which ordered that he should be reinstated and allowed to judge. The gentleman on the left side, which is the president of the court, however, so far has refused to comply with the judgment. Judge Justician was also formally suspended by the controversial disciplinary chamber of the Polish Supreme Court. To recall, on 8 April 2020, the ECJ ordered an inter issued an interim um, measure in case C79119R and told Poland to suspend the operations of the disciplinary uh, chamber because it was a threat to the independence of, the, um, of judicial independence in Poland. Even before the joint chambers of the Polish Supreme Court um, declared that the disciplinary chamber um, was a non-court because of the lack of independence and impartiality. However, the, the disciplinary chamber has ignored these decisions both from the Polish Supreme Court and from the ECJ and it keeps issuing decisions lifting immunities of, it, of disobedient judges. Um, on the next picture, uh, the person um, in front is Judge Igor Tulej. In December 2016, at the session of a Polish parliament, the incumbent political power uh, decided to move the session from the plenary room to another room for an important voting. It was alleged that certain members of the political opposition were not allowed into that room so that they couldn't vote. Criminal investigation in that matter was discontinued, but the discontinuation was challenged to court. Judge Tuleya, who was sitting on that case, quashed the decision uh, to discontinue the investigation and gave his reason at a public session, which he was entitled to do. On this basis, criminal investigation has been launched against him. He was removed from his office and the application to lift his immunity is pending before the disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court. The lady on this picture is Judge Moravitz, who had been the president of the regional court in, in Krakow. After the Minister of Justice declared a personal crusade against her, she was removed from office under charges of corruption related to issues she couldn't have been involved in. The disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court was, against, was again used in lifting her immunity. Now, these are just three examples of judges who attempted to remain on the right bank of that river, which we could figuratively call the river of the rule of law. None of them is currently allowed to see this judge, what was their professional sense of living, precisely for being faithful to the values on which the European Union 
proclaims to be built. They are suspended, their salaries have been reduced, and they are facing a disciplinary or criminal liability. There are many more examples of great heroic judges in Poland who remain faithful to their oaths and values. But many others will simply go with the flow or follow the path of the least resistance. In one of the most controversial and important decisions that were recently taken by the Polish Constitutional Court, case K1-20, uh, Judge Leon Keres, in his separate opinion, said that the law, as opposed to morality or religion, shouldn't commit individuals to behave heroically. And I'm asking, is the EU purporting to build a system that should hinge on personal heroism of Polish judges? In at least two other matters, Polish judges referred questions to the ECJ, asserting they were afraid to rule in the matters be before them, because this could involve either giving decisions that could declare important liability of the Polish state, or they wouldn't follow the request of the prosecution. They said in uh, the orders referred to the ECJ that they were afraid of uh, disciplinary sanctions. The ECJ washed their hands and declared the questions inadmissible. Let me move on to other problems. In a recent judgment, Xera Flor versus Poland, the European Court of Human Rights declared that some of the judges of the Polish constitutional courts were unlawfully appointed. And as a result, a judgment issued by a bench of that court, including one of the unlawfully appointed judges, violated Article 6 of the European Convention. There's also a growing body of law, also from Luxembourg and Polish courts, to the effect that the entire appointment process of judges in Poland introduced um, since 2017 is seriously flawed. So let me pose these two questions. One, will the courts composed of these judges be considered to be courts or tribunals in the sense of Article 267 of the um, Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union? And if not, under Achmea, are they better than investment treaty tribunals? My second question, why should investors, or for, for what it matters, courts from other member states, have trust in these courts? My next concern is the refusal of Polish authorities to comply with orders and decisions of EU courts. We have recently seen examples of Polish highest authorities, as well as Polish courts, openly ignoring for political reasons provisional measures ordered by Kishbeck. Examples include not only the pristine Białowieża forest, which used to be the favorite hunting grounds of the Lithuanian and Polish rulers in the past. They also include, more importantly, orders and reforms concerning the reform of the judicial system in Poland. And finally, the prime minister of the Polish government, the gentleman uh, in the left, um, in the bottom left-hand side of the picture, uh, recently made an application uh, to declare that the EU treaties are inconsistent to the Polish, with the Polish constitution. The case is currently pending before the Polish Constitutional Court, which as the European Court of Human Rights confirmed is unlawfully constituted, and which has taken its practice of law to such level that it's easily predictable what its judgment is going to be in such a politically important case. So let me summarize. We have a large and important member of the EU that's doing its utmost to eradicate the independence of its own judiciary. This obeys decisions of its own courts, the EU courts, and openly questions the primacy of EU law. In parallel, we are cutting out the access to any other form of investor state dispute settlement, and we force investors to appear before the same judges that the ECJ will likely declare are not courts or tribunals within the meaning of Article 267 of the, of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Mr. Donald Tusk, when he was still the president of the European Council, once famously said that there should be a special place in hell for those who promoted Brexit without even a sketch of a plan of how to carry it out safely. And I wonder, Europe, do you have a sketch of a plan how to protect your investors or even your own judges. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Wojciech, for a very impressive and sensitive uh, presentation, uh, giving insight from your country. I hope everybody uh, is acquainted with this situation, but it's always very hard and painful to speak from inside, from uh, from from your country perspective on on on, on such an issue. Thanks, God and Lithuania. We, we do not have such a situation, and I hope we will not have it. But of course, we are also not without very similar, not so much discussed, but very similar similar problems. So, and actually, it clearly shows now what Eastern and Central Europe uh, is an issue and may have, obviously, may have its own, let's say, specificity and interest that have to be taken and must be taken into account or already had to be in the past before making such radical decisions because nobody knows what's the, the way out, as you as you told. Thank you very much. Um, and um, uh, sorry for extending you all, all term of our con conference, but uh, but I hope I hope you will have still some time to listen to us. And uh, and again, thank you, thank you very much. And now we are going to our last speaker, uh, neighbor from Latvia, Ilze Mikulana, who will speak mostly on a very specific issue uh, concerning impartiality requirement to arbitrators, but actually very connected and very important one. Ilze is a lawyer uh, at the State Chancellery of the Republic of Lithuania, where her task is to ensure state representation in investment treaty dispute. Prior to joining the State Chancellery, she was the legal editor for the weekly magazine for lawyers and visiting lecturer at the Riga Graduate School of Law. She obtained uh, her PhD in law at the European University in 2014, and spe she specializes in international investment law. Ilze, the floor is yours. It would be very interesting to hear from you about impartiality. Um, thank you, Inga and Salveg, first of all, for giving me this opportunity to be there and present among these experienced and distinguished panelists. And as other ones, I'm also here in private capacity and nothing that is uh, said is attributable to the state. And in transition from Wojciech's uh, uh, questions raised about uh, impartiality and trustworthiness of uh, domestic courts, I would like probably it like smoothly transitions to my topic, which is impartiality and the reform processes in ICSID and ANSA trial regarding impartiality requirements of arbitrators in investment, uh, international investment arbitrations. And the question is pretty much the same. Uh, what are the practices by arbitrators uh, uh, what might shed a light on their potential impartiality and objectiveness. And I would like to start with more like a theoretical take on uh, how I would see international investment arbitration and how it functions. And it is a system that safeguards rule of law. And it is important that this kind of system is perceived as legitimate and practice of decision makers. So in, in investment arbitration arbitrators, play a role in how the system is perceived. And uh, that is important uh, because in investment arbitration is also intended as effective replacement of national and international courts in adjudicating the legitimacy of national regulations and administrative acts, which are challenged by foreign investors in impartial and objective uh, a dispute settlement mechanism, which is intended to be the investment arbitration. And uh, this, uh, and that is sort of constitutional element or constitutional role of investment arbitrations, despite the fact that they are ad hoc, so created for specific uh, cases only. But uh, this constitutional element plays out in, in the fact that these investment arbitrations and arbitrators, they assess fairness uh, in the application of law by, by the host states. They safeguard legal certainty of foreign investors. They ensure access to justice by foreign investors. And, uh, and some tri tribunals even openly embrace this constitutional dimension by by getting inspired by domestic administrative constitutional courts and uh, European Court of Human Rights and uh, European Court of Justice, borrowing, for instance, proportionality analysis in their decision-making. Uh, 
in addition uh, to these kind of aspects, investment protection, and so also its dispute settlement mechanism is not an aim in itself, but it is established in for a wider context, and that is for safeguarding and promoting economic development, which nowadays is sustainable development in home and host states. And this integrated the inherent object and purpose also is a pretty constitutional aspect that it requires balancing of economic and investor interests with other stakeholders' interests in, in, in field of social rights and environment protection. And so this constitutional dimension of international investment arbitration, it bears certain responsibilities on adjudicators, arbitrators, and imposes certain expectations directed at them. And one is that they are not anymore service providers, what could be the very beginning of uh, investment arbitration before 2000s, uh, by service providers understanding that arbitrators are selected by parties in order to not only decide the dispute that is put before them, but they are more uh, guardians of law and they have responsibilities not only in front of the parties, but of the legal system as such. And also those who don't have a representation in, in, in that legal system directly as third party stakeholders. And that brings us to the impartiality requirement and the practice of double hatting and the associated issue of issue conflict. What is double hatting? And uh, it's also described and defined now in the Ancetral Working Group number three uh, papers, which deals with, uh, with the reform of procedural norms. And double hatting is a practice of uh, usually some individuals who act as counsel or party appointed experts or expert witnesses in, in one arbitration and arbitrators in different arbitration proceedings. So they, they represent parties and they also act as decision makers in different, uh, in different proceedings. But this dual role uh, raises the possibility of potential or real conflict of interests and the so-called issue conflict. And about that a little bit, like in, in a few sentences later. This double hatting or uh, taking up different roles, decision-making roles and representing roles is not pro prohibited by existing codes of conduct and guidelines. And I should also mention that some of these guidelines are developed by the practitioners themselves. There are very few known examples when uh, uh, parties have successfully challenged uh, decision makers on the basis of uh, double hatting and challenges in general are difficult to satisfy in, in investment arbitration. And they are extremely fact-based and require quick reaction uh, by those who are involved, uh, data analysis and also uh, meeting the deadlines. And only in 2018, uh, Rather recently, it, it emerged that in 2019, a Cyprus successfully challenged an arbitrator, which was sitting in an intra-EU uh, case and acted simultaneously as a counsel in cases where also intra-EU jurisdictional objection was or could have been raised. And uh, the case was administered by Stockholm Chamber of Commerce and uh, uh, in that case, uh, the, the institution deciding the challenge was convinced that arbitrator in this specific situation might be personally and financially interested in a certain outcome. Uh, also last year, it emerged that uh, in different case, also in the EU BIT case, uh, uh, the award was annulled because arbitrator failed to disclose uh, his relationship with one of the experts of the parties. But those developments are rather recent. Uh, and in general, like me, a judgment, uh, when it was rendered, it seemed that the investment community was self-regulating regarding double hatting. And we saw several resignations from annulment committees uh, on the basis, uh, what seemed to be on the basis of double hatting. And also uh, Slovakia in uh, uh, mineral water case, I, I will bar myself from pronouncing the Polish uh, person's name, uh, 
uh, challenged an arbitrator uh, on the basis of uh, his former role as counsel to parties. And, uh, and in that case, before it was decided by the institution, the arbitrator refused himself uh, from sitting as arbitrator. But what I, what I learned from the publicly available information on that case, he took an issue with, the, with the Slovakia, raising this uh, double hatting as a problem and uh, accused state of aggressive behavior in doing that. What are the arguments in favor of this practice? Is the need and effort to expand the pool of arbitrators and not to cut out highly uh, esteemed and uh, very busy practitioners of the field? And uh, however, uh, as Oslo University researchers and Blue Records project uh, have established in, in the now a, a pretty famous article, Revolving Doors in Investment Arbitration, this is a practice of few, but very highly influential arbitrators. Um, not of all. And, and because of that, that it's a practice of very few, it does not you know, justify the argument that it helps somehow in extending the pool of arbitrators. And nevertheless, extending the pool of arbitrators does not outweigh the importance of apparent uh, impartiality of adjudicators in the regime that has a constitutional element, constitutional and public element to it. And that might address public interest issues and third, which affect also third party stakeholders, uh, which are beyond the interests of the disputing parties. So arguments against this practice are based in the now prevailing understanding that international investment arbitration is more public, even constitutional uh, than private. And that is because, the, despite the fact that the procedure of it is mostly based on the commercial arbitration, private commercial arbitration uh, process, uh, respondents are states, uh, usually in their sovereign capacity. Uh, these disputes, which are brought before, before investment tribunals, are usually uh, affecting wider interests than those between disputing parties. And just to give one example, a uh, very old NAFTA case, uh, Glamis Gold, uh, where the uh, issue was about the change of requirements to open pit miners. Uh, um, uh, California uh, changed uh, requirements because where open pit miners were involved, it was also the sacred site of indigenous communities. And although they did not have a standing in, in, in this arbitration because they were neither uh, investors nor, nor the state in that sense, they were expecting and uh, waiting for the outcome of this case because they were directly affected by this investment dispute. So uh, these, these uh, disputes very often uh, affect wider issues than, than the ones uh, between disputing parties. And very often these issues are of public interest like health protection and then notorious Philip Morris cases. Uh, these issues can relate to financial crisis and its management in host states. Uh, they can be about social unrest and its management by host states over subsidizing, like for instance, uh, Mikula cases in, in a way environmental and health protection, corruption issues could be raised in these cases. Also consequences of ACMEA like judgment, uh, which are at least in one field of law, a constitutional uh, issue, like for all the EU member states. And what else is important to kind of uh, pay attention to that arbitral awards uh, are very difficult to challenge or set aside. Uh, there are very few uh, uh, reasons why they can be set aside and they are not because of the fail to state facts correctly or of failure in interpretation of law. They are for grave procedural um, uh, faults and investment awards are uh, applicable and enforceable generally, pre pretty much globally enforceable. There's very limited uh, mechanisms how to address uh, factual and legal mistakes in them if such are made. And these all aspects contribute to the fact that independence and impartiality of decision makers, so arbitrators in the field is of very crucial importance. And, and, and the system functions similarly, like domestic courts, uh, constitutional courts or international courts, but uh, the requirements of impartiality for decision makers differ. We cannot imagine anymore, at least since 2018, ICJ judges, uh, um, uh, sitting as a counsel in one case and being a decision makers in another. Uh, they, in 2018, were barred to take new appointments as arbitrators. 
and also several states have realized already that this this practice of double hatting has been a problematic and it diminishes the legitimacy of the system and uh, several new genera generation uh, investment treaties have excluded this practice and uh, this um, this problem aspect of um, double hatting was also taken up and decided that it's a legal problem enough to be addressed uh, under the ancestral uh, working group three <laughs> reform process and uh, the working group noted that the perception of bias or conflict is sufficient there is no need to to address issues where there is actual conflict which of course depends on specific facts but just the perception of bias is enough to affect the legitimacy of the system and that's why in this field the reform is needed that was decision by the working group in Ancetral. And Ixted and Ancetral have joined their uh, forces and, and developed uh, draft codes of conduct, which are now given uh, for, the, uh, to, for comments by, by working group members and by the states. EU have taken a different approach by proposing, EU and its member states, by proposing uh, to develop an investment court system with permanent um, judges that would solve uh, this problem of double hatting and for legal practitioners taking up multiple roles uh, because they would be just assigned as judges with uh, no possibilities to, to take up uh, party representation at that time while they sit as judges. And the second, uh, I will not touch upon to, 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 to save time, the first uh, draft code of conduct, uh, what the approach was, but the second draft code of uh, conduct also addresses now uh, the proposal on double hatting, addresses what some states have expressed as a problem, um, that this is a, like double hatting should not be permitted while the arbitrator is, while the decision making decision maker is in the position in the position of making a decisions that at that time uh, uh, those decision makers should not act as representing parties in other cases and that is the article four of the draft code of conduct the version two and uh, uh, the new uh, version also imposes uh, disclosure obligations a little bit different than the first draft proposed uh, that arbitrators should kind of uh, disclose all the information that the parties might uh, might think uh, would lead to impartiality, uh, uh, would affect impartiality of the arbitrator. Uh, that has been a problem in practice that because double hatting as such was not barred by, by ethical guidelines, uh, the, the ones existing uh, before these uh, proposed draft codes of conduct, uh, arbitrators uh, could refuse to disclose information that was not publicly available, like, for instance, what kind of uh, issues they would they are facing in where they represent parties in different cases, or whether that creates an issue conflict, namely that they, for instance, in the in intra ubic cases, whether they act as counsels, arguing there is jurisdiction and then deciding in different cases, there is no jurisdiction, or whether they can keep themselves uh, objective in these issues. So the new draft, uh, the second draft code uh, has taken into account some issues that were proposed by the states that it's difficult for arbitrators to convince them that double hatting was a problem. Now by explicitly, explicitly uh, mentioning it, it is a problem. Uh, and secondly, imposing uh, more disclosure duties on arbitrators uh, to give parties information on the cases they set and to make sure that uh, what kind of issues uh, they might face so that the parties, if they are fine with arbitrators double hatting, that they are informed and can make an informed decision that this arbitrator is fit for their, their case. And uh, that, is, that is all in brief. I try to be as brief as possible what I would like to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ilse, very much for a nice, uh, nicely presented um, topic.